shit or not. Okay, so we've already mentioned this. How we use theory in common usage is quite different than from how it's used in science. Sci as we've said, in science, a theory is an explanatory framework. It has withstood repeated experimentation. It continues to produce hypotheses that make testable predictions. So we've talked about how in common speech, theory is something closer to conjecture or guess, but that's not the so in science. In science, to call something only a theory is actually quite high praise. Compliment. OK. Theories can vary in their importance to a given field of inquiry. So for example, I'm a geneticist, so the chromosomal theory of inheritance is quite important to me as a geneticist. That theory postulates that the vehicle for passing hereditary information from one generation to the next is through the vehicle of DNA and chromosomes. That theory was first proposed back in the uh, early 1900s and has received empirical support along the way. You might think that a bit odd. Well, it was at a time in, say, the 1920s, proteins were thought to be the vehicle of heredity because chromosomes were thought to be too simple. They didn't have enough complexity to them. We now have better understanding of how that works. Now, on the other hand, chromosomal theory has been revised as well. We now know that there are other vehicles of inheritance that are not so basically, chromosomes aren't the whole story. They're the main part of the story, but new evidence has shown that there are other vehicles of heredity through the cell cytoplasm, for example. There are certain factors that are passed on that impinge on chromosomes. So it's not strictly one or the other. Another example, germ theory of disease. The, hypo or the theory started as a hypothesis that communicable diseases are caused by microorganisms that you can't see that gained quite a bit of traction in the late 1800s. Strictly not true. There, is now, there are certain diseases that we now know are communicable diseases but are not caused by microorganisms. You might be aware of um, mad cow disease as an example. The infectious agent in mad cow disease is not an organism. It's actually an aberrant protein that has the ability to convert proteins in the new host to its aberrant form and therefore cause disease. So it stands in complete sort of contrast to the established dogma, if you will, that germ theory is the dominant paradigm. Now, on the other hand, it hasn't overturned germ the theory either. Most of germ theory works fine 99% of the time, but here's one rare example. Okay, so where I'm going with that is just to say, okay, different disciplines have different theories. They vary in, in importance. Evolutionary theory is the core theory of biology. It's the most fundamental theory within the biological sciences. If you take in terms of all the different theories, these ones being within biology, evolutionary biology is actually sort of sits at the bottom. Chromosomal theory of inheritance is now, technically speaking, part of the theory of evolution. Likewise, germ theory. It's and what we mean by that in terms of the most fundamental theory for a discipline, evolutionary theory is the one theory in biology that has the broadest explanatory power. Simon, you looked like you had a, a question. No? Okay. All right. Okay. So, how do you do science? There are, there's no precise way to say this is exactly how science is done in every single instance, but this is a general overview of how science works. You start by making observations of the natural world in some way. Those observations lead you to pose certain questions. Those questions might lead you to a hypothesis. So you see something in nature, you say, I wonder why it is that way. Well, perhaps it's that way because... And then what distinguishes science from sort of just armchair level theorizing in the popular sense is science leads you to say, well, okay, if it is that way, then this should be the case and then going on to make a test of that prediction, which then can have one of two outcomes. You may either reject your hypothesis, your prediction didn't pan out, or you may, which would then, sorry, put you back on this loop where you might have to make new observations, ask new questions, and frame a new hypothesis that allows you to make predictions and tests. Or you perhaps may fail to reject your hypothesis. Now this is important in science. Science never offers you proof. Science only offers you the ability to disprove things. 
you may either reject the hypothesis or you may tentatively fail to reject the hypothesis. But that does not provide you proof at that level. All it says is that particular hypothesis is supported by experimental evidence. Now, again, in science, at that point you would say, okay, that hypothesis seems to have withstood that prediction and test. Well, what now? You would frame then a second prediction based on that hypothesis. And again, make another test. It may be on your second go-round that you do reject your hypothesis. It's like, okay, well, it passed the first test, but it didn't pass the second, so my hypothesis must be wrong. So I'll reject it, frame a new one. And the goal is to sort of stay on this loop of hypothesis, prediction, test, the longer you can stay on this loop, the more one has confidence that you have a hypothesis that is at least a reasonable estimate of reality or a reasonable representation of reality. Yeah, sorry. And isn't part of that to have it testable so that other scientists can run that same test Absolutely. and get the same results? Absolutely, that's speaking to the issue of reproducibility and science sort of as an open endeavor that's open to anyone who has the technical capability, such that these aren't done in secret. These are results that are shared with other researchers who can do perhaps the same, repeat your experiments to verify that they were accurate, or perhaps frame new predictions based on your hypothesis. If you stay on this loop long enough, and it's a bit simplified here, not only, it wouldn't be just one hypothesis that would allow you to get through to this point of saying, okay, now I have a theory. Hypothesis just means less than theory, basically mini theory. It's my idea, it's my conjecture, it's been supported by experimental evidence, I have failed to reject this hypothesis and many other hypotheses related to it. If you stay on that loop long enough, eventually you have a theory. And a theory, again, as we've said, is just an explanatory framework that has withstood repeated experimentation. Theories also readily produce new hypotheses. An explanatory framework in science, a theory in science, is sort of the best thing going in science because it gives you the ability to readily, in the face of new observations, you have a theory. Based on that theory, that explanatory framework, you readily can frame new hypotheses in response to new observations and questions. The idea is you already have a good sense of what's going on. You have a reasonable grip on reality. It's an approximation, to be sure, but it allows you to frame new hypotheses as new observations are made, which you then can test and see if you can stay on that loop. Any question, any other questions sort of on science?